Welcome to Painting with Light and Sound. This lecture is designed to help you figure out how to take better still photographs and how to take video for the web. Now, some of you in this class want to be photojournalists and some of you don't. But this is a brief lecture that's going to give you a crash course in how to do better photographs, even if you're only taking them at the family birthday party. One of the ways in which you get better is you look at examples of excellence. You look at the quality work that other people do. And I've selected one photographer whose work that I want you to see because I think it's so inspiring. One of the things that it pays to learn up front is some of the jargon about photography. The first thing is that you make photographs, you don't take them. Your job is to craft them, and I think the word make explains that, that you have control. There are things you can do to take an excellent photograph. If you see in this example, the line between amateur and professional is really starting to blur. Here we have a top photographer at the New York Times, and for the first time ever, the New York Times put an Instagram photograph on its front page. Now, they didn't intend to, they sent a professional photographer, but he was told that he could not go into the locker room with a camera, he could only have his cell phone and his cell phone camera. But because of the talent that the photographer had, it's still a marvelous image to see on the front page of the New York Times, and it shows you what you can do if you learn some of those simple rules. There is a new concept that some news organizations are embracing, which is called good enough. We see the line blurring between amateur and professional. We see more and more citizen journalists contributing things to major news organizations using whatever they happen to have at hand, whether it's a phone like this, my handy dandy Samsung or an iPhone, both of which have excellent abilities to take great photographs. However, there is simply nothing that can beat a camera like this or ones that are above this in quality. These are high megapixel cameras that do wonderful things and you can have an immense amount of control. I'm not going to argue that you can do on a cell phone all of the things you can do with one of the high-end cameras. But you know, if you happen to be on the subway someday and somebody pick, pulls out an automatic weapon, or leaves a bomb on the subway, if you're the person who has the cell phone with you, you want to be able to capture what's happening, not only to be able to share it with your audience, but also so that maybe we can find the people who did it. That's one of the first rules of photography, is that sort of breaking news situation where you always want to be prepared. The good news nowadays is most people have a cell phone with them at all times, and they can capture those images. And I can tell you that if you happen to get those images on the subway, you can probably sell them to a news organization and take a year off in the Riviera afterwards, regardless of whether you're a professional or not. When you paint with light, remember that your subject, whatever it is that you're trying to show people, has to be bathed in light. If you're in a cave and there's absolutely no light source, I hate to say it, my really good camera might be able to show you something, but most cameras, you're just gonna end up with a blurry darkness and you won't know what's going on. You are literally painting that subject with light and there's various kinds of light. There's fluorescent light and Kelvin light and natural sunlight. 
Today's cameras are pretty good at compensating for most of those, or you can use a program afterwards to compensate for strange lighting, but there has to be enough light on your subject for you to be able to see what it is that you want to see and show it to others. So the first thing that you need to think about is, okay, you have your person perhaps that you're taking pictures of, or you're doing a video with that person. What are 99% of the situations you find yourself in? You're in somebody's ugly looking dark office with a few fluorescent lights, maybe a desk light on top. There's some light coming in the windows. They've got Venetian blinds. It's a nightmare as a lighting situation. The first thing to do is think about where the light is falling. Where is the primary light source? If it's falling on your face, that's not the person we want to illuminate. Make sure that the light is on the person you're trying to photograph. And that can sometimes mean you grab the person and if you feel the light on your face, you just go ee, 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 and you turn them around and you make sure the light is on their face. If the light is coming through those Venetian blinds, close the blinds. Find an artificial light source. Make sure that you don't have that dappled look on their face. Check to your lighting, do a little test, take a look later and critique it before you commit yourself to doing the entire interview or the entire photo shoot with the one lighting setup that you have. Make sure that you're not going to be distracted. Make sure there's not a telephone pole growing out of the guy's ear or a coat rack in the back that's very distracting. Sometimes we can use what we'll talk about later, which is depth of field to kind of smorg out the background so that the face pops out but you may not always have enough control to be able to make that happen, so make sure nothing in the background is too distracting. If the person normally wears a hat, right, make sure that you at least get them to tip the brim up because the chances are that's going to put unflattering shadows on their face. If you're outdoors in sunlight, try not to shoot photographs between 10 and 2. That overhead sun often makes it look like things are dripping out of their nose, not the most attractive way to get somebody in either a still photograph or in a video interview. So be aware of those kinds of things and also be aware of eyeglasses. Now, I did an entire interview with a man out at his farm and it was far enough away I didn't want to have to go back. And what did you see when you looked at it? You saw me reflected in his eyeglasses. Hmm, not good. So if the people normally wear eyeglasses, have them keep them on because chances are they'll squint if you make them take them off. But if they don't normally wear glasses, ask them to remove them and you save a lot of problems with glare and a lot of problems with what's reflected in the eyeglasses. But look at all of those details, especially on that main subject, to see how you can make them comfortable, but at the same time get them in a position you don't want them squinting into a bright sun at noon, and you don't want ugly shadows coming down in their face that makes them look like Dracula. Uh, your challenge is to also think about, are there simple things you could do as a reflector to add a little fill light? Very rarely do we have the luxury of bringing with us a full lighting kit and an opportunity to do what's called a three-point lighting setup. For those of you that want to do some portrait photography, you'll want to study up on that. But you want to be able to have a little fill sometimes to take care of that face especially and light it up. Sometimes just getting somebody to hold a white sheet of paper next to the subject. And there are also these reflectors you can buy that are gold on one side that add a nice warm light. Or they're white on the other side and sometimes you'll see somebody with a professional photographer kind of angling that reflector to help them get a good light on the subject's face. Think about lighting. You are painting with light. What's on that person's face or the object that you're trying to photograph. So that's probably the most critical feature for be, uh, critical advice I can give you for making sure that your video and your still photographs is think about that light.